Today we're going to talk about a company called Iridium, and our story starts with ARK's Space ETF, which we reviewed last year, and I'll put a link to that article in the description of this video, along with the piece that was used to produce this. Uh, but when we reviewed ARK's ETF, it wasn't overly compelling, so we were able to take more than 80% of the holdings in the ETF at the time and put them into various buckets. You can see here that defense contractors made up close to 30% of the weightings. Then strangely enough, you had 3D printing. They actually had their own ETF included as a constituent for their space ETF, which is rather odd. And then you had these other companies like um, they had Joby, some of the EV tall firms. They had a uh, though there would have been a couple SPACs from that. Uh, Rocket Lab made its way in there. Uh, they have some other strange names, Amazon, Google, uh, and then, um, you know, entertainment, knowledge, online shopping. This stuff just seems uh, rather unassociated to space, though I'm sure you could uh, make an argument for online companies benefiting from increased connectivity. But one of the firms that came up is their second largest holding that we hadn't really taken a very good look at is Iridium Communications. So we decided to dig in and see what that firm was up to. And the last time we looked at them was back in early 2021 when we wrote about $5 billion satellite operator stocks. You can see the list of names here. Iridium at the time was the biggest. They very well may still be the biggest. And we had noted that all these companies are using satellites that they've put in the sky to offer services and products down here on Earth. That's what they have in common. So whether we call them satellite stocks, satellite operator stocks, or space stocks is irrelevant. The question is, do we want to invest in any of these companies? So we've had a particular interest in global connectivity for rather selfish reasons because uh, a lot of us here at Nanalyze travel a lot, myself included, and we're only limited by the places where we can access broadband internet to be able to uh, do research and, for example, record these videos. So we've been watching the global internet race quite eagerly. And when we observe satellite companies, we see a common business model, which looks something like this. It's actually quite simple. Uh, visualize a service that people need, for example, global broadband. Then you need to spend billions of dollars up front that you've managed to get from investors to build your satellites, launch them into space, get them working, uh, wrap that in a software platform, turn on your service and start selling it. And then what you'll have is a lot of debt that you need to pay down that you incurred for the cost of the infrastructure. Now, the first time Iridium tried to do that, they spent $5 billion building the first constellation and they actually went bankrupt in 1999. Over the next decade, they spent $3 billion building their next constellation that went live in 2019 with 66 satellites. And now what they're doing is harvesting the cash from that platform. And this is a very nice table in their annual report. This is another firm that doesn't do a very good job of investor relations. So we tried to find a decent investor deck of which they had none, but they had a two uh, clear or almost three hour video of their management team talking about how promising the company was. We sat through about half of that. But this table here provides enough metrics for investors to follow what they're getting up to. So you can see total revenue there in 2021 was 614 million. That growth, by the way, based on what they're uh, estimating their guidance for 2022, gives them a compound annual growth rate over. Uh, the years that you see here along with this coming year of about 6.6%. They're not growing that fast. You can see that services make up a good proportion of their revenues. About 20% of their total revenues come from government. And you see here this nice, healthy 61.5% margin. You can see they're growing subscribers over time. Their capital expenditures dropping since they've already spent all that money deploying their satellites. And their net debt of about 1.6 billion seems to be uh, staying about the same. And one of the things they did was announce a $300 million share buyback program. I think that's probably to help improve uh, some of the ratios used on their debt covenants. So certainly want to keep an eye on how they're able to manage that debt. But when we look at revenues broken down in more detail here, because we particularly 
are interested in how Iridium competes against Starlink, you know, SpaceX's subsidiary. And when we look at the offerings here, you see voice and data, uh, IoT data, and broadband. And just to give you an example of um, what these various buckets represent, uh, First, before we do that, take note here of the number of subscribers and the growth there of IoT data. You see that makes up what? About two thirds of their total subscriber base, but only 18% of revenues. So when we look at these other buckets, uh, voice and data broadband, uh, about a third, this was at the end of 2021, about a third of their subscribers are people with personal devices. I'll give you an example of what that might be. So in this picture, you can see a Russian research vessel called the Academic Sergei Vavilov. And myself and about 40 people uh, took this ship from the southern tip of South America through the Drake Channel for two days down to Antarctica. And when we got there, we ran a marathon. And all of us had Garmin watches on our wrists. And when we turned those on, they all worked along with the satellite phone that we had on the ship to send out text messages or make phone calls. It was probably one of the more remote places that I've ever been. Communication was extremely limited, but how is it possible that these $200 Garmin watches that we were all wearing were able to communicate? Well, Garmin happens to be a client of Iridium and their technology is specialized in that it can allow a very small device to communicate with satellites and sort of a pay as you go plan where you might think of Starlink as providing a big data pipe for a fixed cost. So that use case, the Garmin watch use case is a great example of what the IOT opportunity looks like. So for Iridium, their IOT data subscribers have been growing at about 24% compound annual growth rate over the last five years. As we saw before, now representing about 74% of their commercial customer base. For example, their devices have been adopted as standard equipment on uh, heavy equipment manufacturers like Caterpillar, Hitachi, Komatsu, and Dusan, and they'll provide telematic solutions for end users. Trimble is also a client of Iridium. And the 76% uh, of subscribers that are growing uh, at 24% CAGR only represent 18% of total revenue. So you need to take that into account. And the company talks about this as being a very um, unique and uh, bountiful growth opportunity that they're looking to capture and that they don't see Starlink as a competitive threat in that niche. Certainly broadband, you can see here, 7% of their revenues would. But here's a very interesting article. I'll put a link to this it's about swarm technologies and we wrote this last year it looked at an acquisition spacex made here you can see the device in question that allows for a low cost two-way global satellite connectivity uh, method for iot devices so spacex is indeed paying very close attention to the iot opportunity and when we talk about spacex in particular their efforts in IoT and broadband. That refers to Starlink, which is a SpaceX subsidiary that's targeting what they think is a trillion dollar opportunity, global broadband. So their product offering now includes services to residences, uh, businesses, uh, recreational vehicles, maritime and aviation. And what's interesting is Starlink sats that they're shooting up. I think they have about 4,400 satellites in the sky now. Uh, the next generation, they're four to five times larger with an order of magnitude improvement in useful data throughput. For all practical purposes, it means 10 times better. So that's certainly a concern when you think about a company like Iridium that uh, is now having to compete against an entrepreneur who's been very successful at first principles thinking. He literally built his own rocket company, which is actually used to launch Iridium satellites, and used that rocket company to launch his own constellation. So when we look at Starlink versus Iridium, here's one example of the two companies, um, how different they are. So Iridium's management team talks about this you know, future plan of licensing their technology to smartphone providers so that people can have connectivity when they're outside of cell phone service. But 
look at what SpaceX is doing. This past summer, SpaceX and T-Mobile announced what's called coverage above and beyond, which should debut next year with those big satellites that they're building, four to five times bigger than the ones they have now. If everything goes as planned, T-Mobile customers will be able to access Starlink connectivity with their current phones and have coverage anywhere on the planet. So Starlink is certainly a, a step ahead, it appears, of Iridium, what they describe as aspirational but feasible plans to uh, sell their technology or license it to smartphone providers. So uh, that is also of a concern, I think, to people. The uh, fanatics over at ASTS Space Mobile uh, need to pay attention to this as well. Just to conclude, we don't believe Iridium offers sufficient upside to compensate for the risks we're taking. This is a very risky business to be in. They already failed once. And the upside, the 6.6% growth they're realizing just isn't uh, juicy enough to uh, compensate for that risk. There are government revenues and uh, commercial relationships. These may provide sufficient barriers to entry. Look, there's no reason that you can't have Iridium uh, thrive alongside Starlink because it's such a large opportunity. But um, the question is, you know, if you were going to invest in one of those two companies, which would it be? And you always want to invest in leaders. So the clock is ticking on the 10 year capital expenditures holiday uh, for Iridium. And eventually they're gonna need to have paid down that debt and raise uh, even more money to uh, replace their constellation. And of course, you know, SpaceX has a five year lifespan for their satellites and Iridium has a 10 year. And there's actually an advantage to having a shorter lifespan because you can iterate your technology quicker. So um, please put your comments in the comment section. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video today.